thank you, um, thank you so much. Okay, so we have uh, uh, an other panel uh, in front of us today where we will uh, focus on, uh, on conduct, on governance, governance, on remuneration, incentives, and, uh, and all the rest of it. And uh, while, of course, it is my intention to let um, most of the positions being taken by the, uh, by the panelists, I should say beforehand that uh, from my own experience in the Netherlands, um, we also have had some uh, experience, I should say, with these issues. And an important example that always comes to my mind, which is, I think, quite illustrative of the problems that one encounters in, in this area, is the case that we uh, lived through with uh, ABN AMRO. That's a bank, um, sort of, that was relatively successful in the years uh, living up to the crisis. It was not one of the most successful banks, but it was doing okay. Um, but underneath the surface, it was not at all doing okay. And actually, a book has been published on uh, everything that happened there, which I think is quite instructive for those interested in a sort of case study of, uh, to, of the extent to which behavior and culture can really undermine the appropriate functioning of a financial institution. The book is called The Perfect Prey in English. Um, and what, what the book actually shows is that even though the bank made billions and billions of profits uh, every year, but behind the scenes, the executives were actually trapped in internal conflicts that were fueled by a surplus of ambition, arrogance, and indecisiveness. There was uh, an atmosphere of divide and rule. There was a CEO that liked to talk about his firm in the first person singular. Um, which is since then something that I developed an allergy uh, to, I can uh, assure you. Um, and there was also a very weak or even virtually absent supervisory board to provide a counterweight and to intervene. And this toxic tone from the top obviously also find its way to the layers uh, directly underneath the board. So the bank sort of tried program after program to cut costs. But what all the 14 division directors directly under the board did was not cutting costs, but shifting costs onto each other. So there was a, a continuous dogfight in the institution where one division tried to shed its cost uh, onto other divisions. And since board members didn't talk to each other, well, why would division directors sort of come to a mutual uh, resolution of, uh, of these uh, problems? Well, plagued by, on all fronts, frustrated uh, sort of by mutinous uh, managers, ABN AMRO then became the prey for shareholders who sort of sensed a, a quick uh, rise in their share price and subsequently they couldn't defend themselves, were taken over by uh, the three, what was it, magic, uh, the three musketeers, um, RBS, Fortis, and through a short stint at Santander, Monte dei Paschi. The, those were the three banks that ended up with a piece of ABN AMRO. It's, a, it's quite a decent list to look through uh, nowadays. <laughs> um, but here again, I mean, the issue was not so much capital, liquidity, sort of the quantitative measures. The issue was very clear, sort of the board, its uh, management behavior, and what that sort of told about the, the, the tone. The issue was also uh, an absence of reflective skills. There was no capacity for self-reflection in the board. There were no sort of uh, effective checks, uh, checks and balances. A very presidential model with all the flaws that such a model uh, brings, uh, brings with it. The issue was also that regulation, can it really have an impact on a situation like this? That's something uh, that I would also like to uh, ask the panelists a bit later on uh, in, uh, in this panel. It led us to increase our supervision in this area. So since, let's say, 2009, 2010, we have a dedicated team within the Netherlands Bank which is focused at the supervision of behavior uh, and culture. And um, the model that we use there can best be visualized by an iceberg. The idea behind an iceberg is that only the tip of the iceberg is visible. That's the sort of visible behavior that people uh, display. But of course, underwater, there's a much more important part of behavior, for instance, the group dynamics, or the mindset, the prejudices, the things that are not being sort of made explicit in internal uh, deliberations. Now, in, in our supervision, we now try to focus much more on behaviors 
that are related to the way decisions are being made, how leadership is uh, shaped in an institution, and how decisions are being communicated communicated and, uh, and executed, because a lot of uh, leadership also comes with uh, communication. So that is roughly what I think this panel uh, should be about. We have a mixed panel, as was already introduced, regulators and practitioners from, uh, from the industry. And I'd like to open uh, the discussion in the panel by asking uh, a question about what sort of authorities did since the crisis. They introduced remuneration standards. They uh, try to align uh, incentives with risk-taking behavior and also with accountability regimes at the board. Um, most of them have revised their supervisory programs, including, uh, including the, the Netherlands Bank itself. Um, but yet, still 10 years, more than 10 years on, we're still seeing a lot of headlines exposing very weak governance practices from unscrupulous chairman to fraudulent staff. So, from your perspective, what can be done to affect a meaningful and a lasting change in governance and behavior? Or, just to be a little bit provocative, is it wishful thinking that we can correct corporate uh, culture through sort of regulation or supervision? So, I'd like to simply uh, start on my left and, and, and first give the floor to, uh, to Judy Dixon. Thank you. Well, uh, I think that um, meaningful and lasting change in governance is actually somewhat elusive. I've seen some good examples of governance since the emphasis on it uh, since 2007, but the, as Close has said, in the public domain there are a lot of examples of bad governance out there right now. And so why is that? Why are we not getting the change? Um, you know, some possible answers are first that it's human nature, and I, I think governance might be a bit like supervision and regulation with that pendulum swinging back and forth. Um, secondly, I think that uh, getting culture right and achieving effective governance is a really big job and I think it's underestimated. Either that or some of these firms are really too big to, to manage and too big to govern. Um, I also think that not enough attention is paid to supervisors in this area and to ensuring that they have the resources to oversee governance effectively. And I will say that since the global financial crisis, supervisors have done some very basic things, which I've achieved a lot. So in, surprisingly, I think they focused on things like whether new board members have the time to fulfill their duties because a lot of people were coming forward and they were on seven public boards, which is really kind of impossible. Uh, they were asking that boards ensure they do effective self-evaluations. They were asking them to proactively look at the culture within their institutions. Um, they were even saying maybe there should be some people on these boards who know something about the sector in which the company is operating. I mean, these are pretty basic changes that supervisors, even supervisors that are not well resourced, uh, I think implemented uh, fairly well. But this is a big job, as I said, either it's a big job and people underestimate it or firms are too big to manage, I don't know. But when you look at some of the examples in the public domain, I pick uh, Commonwealth Bank of Australia only because there's a lot of information in that case, uh, since there was a royal commission. And it had some significant cultural initiatives underway. It had a speak up campaign. It had a campaign to move the bank from collegiality, to, to move it from uh, combative behavior to a more collegial, collaborative, and trusting environment in terms of risk management. That uh, actually backfired. So cultural initiatives are not um, easy once they are uh, launched. But while they, they were doing this, they allowed some serious basic gaps in governance to exist. I mean, you had an internal audit committee that wasn't getting audit reports, even the ones with big issues in them. They weren't calling the heads of the functions who had bad internal audits before them. They weren't closing off the audit issues. Um, they condoned, according to the, the uh, inquiry there, a weak voice of risk and a very strong uh, voice of finance. I think those are pretty basic governance failings. Um, and I think that if you've got basic gaps in governance like that, which everyone can see at the institution, you're probably likely going to have some cultural issues as well. 
Just another quick example, because a lot has been written about it in the public, it's in the public domain, is Wells Fargo. And that bank actually had a lot of really good policies in place. It had multiple controls to prevent abuse. It always talked about culture. It had an ethics program. It had a whistleblower hotline. It had a senior management incentive system <coughs> that had protections consistent with best practices for minimizing risk. So it, it was actually doing a lot. The remuneration systems were tied to risk management. Uh, they had clawbacks in case <coughs> bonuses were inappropriately earned, et cetera. Well, what went wrong? Aside from the fact that branch personnel were compensated for selling, cross-selling, uh, you had a CEO who walked around and said, eight is great. Eight meant get eight products into the hand of the customer. Um, the annual report of 2010, I, I looked at this and I couldn't really believe that an annual report would say this, but the annual report said, this the CEO is quoted as saying, I was asked why I picked eight. I picked eight because it rhymed with great. And then he went on to say, perhaps our new cheer should be, let's go again for 10. To me, this is very unusual language to see in an annual report. Um, and so, so, you know, is that a, just a lack of challenge? Is it hubris? What is it uh, that would lead a board not to question language like that in an annual report? Um, I would say that uh, technology might be a game changer here in terms of allowing boards to better assess the culture within their organizations. Things like language, psychology, science. I mean, there's a lot that's going on now that might be helpful to boards, I don't know. Um, and the last point I'll make is on the supervisory side, 25% um, of the FSAPs which have been done um, post-crisis indicate a problem with supervisory intensity. And I would say that's, that's low-balled the number, but 25% of FSAPs show supervisors are not being intensive enough. And governance is the area where you really do need senior level engagement of supervisors. So I would say that that's, that's telling us that um, more needs to be done from supervisors. They've probably only uh, touched the surface of what needs to be done in terms of overseeing governance. Thank you, Julie. That was very helpful. Uh, maybe the first perspective from, uh, from the industry, Mario. Thank you, Klaus. Um, so, um, the Abbey and Ambro and the Wells Fargo case, I think, um, um, if the question is, uh, could uh, supervisors uh, uh, prevent them? I think, honestly, first of all, it should have been the role of the boards, as Julie said, uh, the management and the rest of the people. So, whatever the CEO does, uh, you know, there are thousands of people around uh, the CEO, and they should uh, they should step up and speak. Uh, and I hope that uh, in our company they would do it in case I get mad one morning and I start uh, naming uh, products that way. Um, so I think honestly that uh, supervisors have done a great job, but they shouldn't be, and they cannot be responsible for this, um, these cases uh, which have a lot with uh, human nature and the human weaknesses. Uh, and I'm not sure that regulators um, or supervisors uh, can go after um, all the weaknesses of human beings. Now, among the things that have been done over the years, I think we have strengthened the system a lot better than it was before. But I'd like to focus on a number of things that uh, concern us us, at least as, uh, as an individual company, and where we try to act, and I'd like to share them. We think that there is too much of a short-term orientation still in the markets, and uh, we try to run our um, organization not only for shareholders, but for a broader uh, set of uh, stakeholders. And uh, we started a year ago changing the incentives uh, um, um, all through the organization. Um, incentivize people on customers, incentivize people on sustainability, and of course also having the typical profit um, targets that every company has. Um, and then progressively we raise the weight 
Um, and so this year, we gave almost 50% of the variable compensation to um, um, incentives uh, or to incentivize behaviors uh, which are not in the PNL result of the organization. And of course, we do care a lot for PNL results, you know, and uh, there shouldn't be any doubt about that. Uh, but the message we're giving is that we care also for the employees, and we want uh, employees to be engaged, happy, motivated, and, and feeling safe with the organization. And so we monitor the employee satisfaction, and we introduce um, that with the 20% weight in our, um, in our incentive system, and we monitor for customers. And they, all, and they have a 30% weight in the um, uh, remuneration of, of everyone in the organization, everybody, <laughs> including the controlling functions, including the administrative people. Everyone has a customer target uh, as part of an organization that has to think about the customer, has to think about the employee, and then has to think about the society. And this is the sustainability part. Uh, that doesn't solve the short-term orientation. Uh, all companies today is, are run with a very short-term orientation, no matter what we speak and no matter what we pray in public. Um, and, and it's difficult to change that because we have investors who very, very seldom own shares for more than a few weeks. Right? It's very rare for us to have stable investors, or we have index funds. And index funds, frankly, don't care for what we do. And so, again, it's difficult for the investors and I meet investors uh, regularly to talk about uh, how we're building the future of our company. They just don't care for that. And this is something that uh, we should all be mindful of and we should be all be thinking of because we need companies to make investments uh, for the midterm, right? Whatever, whatever definition you take of that, it doesn't matter uh, you know, what we will perform in the next quarter. It doesn't matter not even what we do in the year. It matters what we do over the next four or five years for the organization and for the societies, the communities where we live. But that's not the way we're measured. Right? That's not the way shareholders act uh, with us. And you know, with all the changes we made in the internal systems, we haven't been able yet to come with uh, a clear mid-term, long-term orientation um, for the PNL of the company. The PNL of the company is still based on a one-year measure, right? Because this is what we are asked by uh, shareholders, and this is what also the board is asking us to deliver the one-year measure. And I'm not shy of that. Of course, I have to, and I think there are ways in which you can do that without compromising what you do. But I'd like um, you to uh, understand the pressure that you get, and that sometimes this, this pressure can contrast with the mid-term, the long-term interest of, of the organization and of the communities in which you run that organization. And we don't have systems to report on that, or in a sense, the externalities or the cost of externalities um, is transferred back to the society and is not made to bear for the companies who create these costs, if I'm clearing what I'm saying. And, and that, again, is something that, I guess, uh, regulators, supervisors should uh, reflect on, because I don't think it's doing, it's doing that much good to, to um, the society where we live. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for having me. And of course, happy 20th anniversary for the FSI. But I uh, want to stress this because um, it is also the 20th anniversary of our corporate governance principles at the OECD. And um, um, we do um, set global standards for uh, corporate governance. 47 countries have adopted them, um, and uh, including 11 non-OECD members. Um, and. We've been making progress in um, setting standards. We've re um, even revised them recently to address key issues that include remuneration standards and accountability regimes, among others. So we're doing our best to keep um, those uh, rules and standards uh, evergreen. Uh, but then we see this flurry of uh, corporate scandals, I mean, not limited to the financial sector, and uh, this really worries us a lot. Um, <clears throat> Weak enforcement matters in some jurisdictions, um, regulators' resource constraints, um, also um, effective implement implementation um, 
hampered by uh, uh, um, still misaligned incentives. Um, and uh, um, well, we've been conducting um, uh, peer reviews at the OECD, that is cross-country peer reviews, thematic peer reviews. Um, also, we published the Corporate Governance Factbook um, to share um, the experiences of countries. But um, um, there's still a lot to do in this uh, space uh, where um, just having the right principles and standards uh, would not suffice. And so um, uh, we really have to look at uh, implementation, but particularly the uh, daily interactions, the, uh, the responsibilities and the decision making in individual companies. And so a lot has already been said on this front. Uh, actually, um, a lot uh, was said by uh, uh, the two uh, previous speakers. And uh, with Julie, of course, uh, it's not a coincidence because we discussed this a lot at the FSB and uh, uh, we did um, provide some uh, hopefully useful um, uh, recommendations to uh, uh, regulators and supervisors. Um, but um, my main uh, conclusion will be that um, <clears throat> um, the role of the uh, of public policy is not to really trying to uh, 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 second guess business decisions or to um, prescribe <clears throat> what is good uh, for the, the business. Um, I mean, the, the, it is important that is the, the government's role is important in, of course, uh, um, uh, providing a uh, purposeful legal, regulatory, and supervisory framework and environment, given the right incentives uh, um, and also the institutional environment uh, um, to be designed so that it would work towards um, um, uh, developing uh, a good um, uh, corporate culture and, um, um, of course, to to have uh, the, the governance right at uh, uh, public companies. But um, but then, um, I mean, basically, um, we have to go deeper into that, uh, to, to the, 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 the individual firm level, if we really want to um, prevent uh, those uh, um, uh, um, uh, misbehaviors, bad judgments, uh, um, mistakes from happening. Now, um, at least um, uh, one colleague uh, of mine uh, in my previous job uh, as regulator uh, told me that uh, this was like um, um, pursuing eternal peace. That is, um, um, uh, this is something we have to aim for, but uh, uh, in a way, at least in the near term, uh, you, you don't really have um, a good uh, <clears throat> chance of uh, achieving that. Um, uh, now, uh, but this is not, of course, to uh, to to uh, um, to give up on this uh, um, endeavor, but to um, um, at least the, the regulators and supervisors they can do a much better job in uh, identifying vulnerabilities, uh, uh, pointing out uh, potential weaknesses, challenging uh, management, um, and I'm talking about the financial sector now, uh, uh, a, a bit a subset of, of course, our. Um, corporate governance space at UACD, but um, really there's a lot to do on that front as well. So um, good rules and standards, um, keeping them evergreen, uh, more resources uh, and uh, uh, enforcement powers for the regulators and supervisors, um, uh, and proper enforcement and implementation. And um, going down to culture, of course, um, uh, um, as Julie mentioned, actually, uh, it, it's, it's not really um, an easy job. But um, uh, let's say um, one um, point that I can add is um, um, we sometimes fall into this trap of um, ticking boxes or um, um, just trying to um, clear the way for um, justifying uh, whatever we're doing by um, <coughs> um, uh, going through a checklist. But um, uh, I mean, corporate culture, corporate, uh, corporate governance is, is, is not really um, uh, achieved or implemented correctly in this way. Uh, that is my conviction. Uh, and uh, we have to really have a constant um, um, dialogue, constant effort to um, monitor uh, uh, developments, uh, weaknesses. Um, <clears throat> The fundamental issue may actually be in the capital markets because um, I, I just heard from um, um, our fellow panelists about uh, a certain short-termism, which um, uh, is, I think, uh, um, uh, a rather fundamental issue uh, that uh, we're facing in uh, capital markets. And uh, with, with the new technologies, it can even be exacerbating. Uh, but um, anyway, um, uh, so there seems to be a lot, a lot more that we can do 
uh, to um, improve um, uh, the status quo, the current uh, situation. Thank you. Thank you, Masa. I think that's an interesting point that you raised. Eh? How intense uh, is the supervision of this? As a matter of fact, what I forgot to say is that in the Netherlands Bank, we hired psychologists for this uh, that sit in bank board meetings that observe, uh, now they monitor, <laughs> uh, without necessarily intervening, but uh, at least uh, to see what's going on. And, uh, and I couldn't agree more. This is not about ticks, ticking boxes. Um, now, um, Jose Vignans, you've been on either side yeah, uh, of both uh, the regulatory side now uh, with the bank. A difference between a bank and an insurance company is often thought to be the horizon at which uh, you're being evaluated. So what is your experience thus far? Thank you, thank you very much, um, Klaas. But le let me start by um, thanking uh, the Financial Stability Institute and, and Fernando for this kind of invitation, congratulating you for the 20th birthday and wishing the Institute uh, a very long and, and, productive, and productive life. Um, yes, banks are, I think, in a, in a slightly different um, um, situation from insurance companies. And this morning, Bill Dudley was mentioning that during the crisis, not only banks uh, got the world into trouble, but there were also some issues in, in non-banks. But let's face it, it is banks which have um, received the, the sharpest criticism. And I think that banks have lost in many countries, not all banks, not in all countries, but the banking system has lost a lot of the trust uh, of society following the crisis. And this is something that needs to be regained. And I think that there are two key things in order to regain that confidence, which is not going to be easy, may not be fully uh, recovered, and certainly it's not going to be fast. And both of them start with an H. The first one is honesty. And that's what we're talking about today. And the second is humility. And I think that before, I think it was when Julie Dixon was talking about, you mentioned the word arrogance. And we could talk about arrogance, masters of, masters of the universe, and so on. These were things we, we had before the crisis. And I think that this combination of honesty, humility, and, and doing a good job that uh, ends up helping society rather than using society to help yourself, this journey is a, is a difficult one, but a necessary one. Um, what has happened over the past 10 years? Has, this been, has there been progress? Yes, undoubtedly there's been progress and, and there's been a, um, a number of things that, that have been done, but we should not underestimate, and we should not underestimate the progress that has been made both outside uh, the uh, banks and inside banks by regulators and supervisors on the one hand and by financial institutions, by banks on the other. And, and let's be aware that a number of the headlines that one can read in the newspapers today refer to things that happened many years ago, but which still are there alive in terms of settlements with, uh, uh, you know, with, uh, with uh, crime enforcement agencies and regulatory agencies and so on. So one needs to be mindful of that. But at the same time, has there been enough progress? And the answer is clearly no. So one should not overestimate the progress that has been made because issues keep arising. And again, we can read about them too often in the newspapers in terms of culture and in terms of conduct. Um, the question that um, we will put in this panel is what, what is it that we need to do in order to have a meaningful and lasting change uh, of the culture of banks so that we don't repeat the mistakes of the past. And I think that there are two things which are critical. One is having the right frameworks, frameworks in terms of supervision, regulation, frameworks in terms of governance. But the other thing has to do having the right people with the right culture. So it's organizational design on the one hand, but then populating this organization with the right people. And if you have the right organization, but you have some of the wrong people, you're going to end up getting into trouble. And if you have the right people, but the wrong organizational design with the wrong governance and the wrong incentives, they will end up doing what is inappropriate. So they will get you into trouble as well. So you have to get both organization and people right, and particularly work on changing the mindset of the banks and all of the people working there, 
top, medium, and bottom. Now, um, I will not talk too much on, on the progress that has been made on the supervisory front, uh, because that has been mentioned before in terms of what has been done and what else needs to be, uh, to be done. But I want to focus a little bit more on the governance uh, uh, side here. And governance has been relatively less emphasized until recently. When we started the global regulatory reform after the crisis, the emphasis was on regulation. Supervision took a backseat. I remember Julie chairing the supervisory uh, sort of subcommittee at the FSB, which I thought put due attention on supervision. But governance was a bit left behind. And, and I'm very glad that this is something that has been revived and that now there are governance frameworks which have been strengthened at the corporate level. Um, and I'm also glad to be living uh, professionally now in a jurisdiction like the UK, and here is uh, Sam Boots, my consolidated um, a regulator, which puts also an emphasis not only on corporate accountability, but also on individual accountability. And I have heard also some people sitting in this room speak already years ago about the importance of having individual uh, accountability. And I think that this is something that has made progress in a number of jurisdictions, but not in others. I know this is a debatable manner, but I think it's something that uh, that should be part of the, uh, of the, of the conversation. Um, I will probably go back to governance when we talk uh, later on, uh, given the questions that uh, class has for us uh, later in the panel. But let me now focus on people. And on people, I think the fundamental thing is to, first of all, have it very clear what's the purpose of the organization, what are you there to achieve beyond making money, because making money for a bank, for an insurance company, for any other organization, only makes sense really if you are achieving something broader, which is good for society. That's the way banking uh, should be understood. Um, and once you have this purpose well-defined, then you have to make sure your culture is aligned with this purpose and that there are some valued behaviors which are consistent with them. And this is the theory of it. Now, the practice is the hard one, which is making sure that everybody working in the organization basically lives these valued behaviors in line with the culture so that you can achieve your purpose. And that is something which is extremely hard, particularly if you want to make sure that everyone in the bank, everywhere and every day, lives these valued behaviors. And there would be people who make mistakes. It may be that not everybody is an angel and things may happen. But this is fundamental that you make a very deliberate effort in order to have that kind of culture. So the people are key once you have the key governance uh, framework. Now, some, some examples of what can be done in order to have the right people's culture in the organization, and uh, which is not uh, just a silver bullet, you need to follow a, a multifaceted approach. First, I think it's critical to pay attention to who do you bring to the uh, institution. How do you hire people? Whom do you hire at all levels? What kind of values these people have? How do you train people inside? How do you promote people? And then, how do you discipline and how you fire people? I think that this sequence from the beginning of the end to the life cycle for the employee are really critical. And you have to put your money where your mouth is. Another thing which is uh, very important is uh, make sure that you do not only project the right tone from the top and lead by example, but that that tone from the top is echoed in the middle and it transmitted to the bottom so that at the end, everyone in the organization own the sort of things that you want and the behaviors that you put in place. Very important also to learn from your mistakes. Things will go wrong sometimes. And then you need to make sure that you are honest, that you investigate what the real causes are, and then take the right measures, however unpleasant they may be, so that this thing doesn't happen again. And I think it's also very important in large global banks 
to analyze what we could call the different cultures of the subcultures of the banks, which may be in different geographies or maybe in different uh, business lines, because these subcultures sometimes tend to create a world which diverges over time from the overall culture of the organization. And that's something that should not be allowed to happen. You need to respect differences among people in different geographies, different sort of uh, uh, ways of uh, seeing uh, uh, the business and, and life, but they need to be particularly uh, abiding by the conduct rules and the culture of the organization. And just one final thing. I think that the only way to show that you have the right culture is to be willing to forego money or making money when your principles are at stake. Otherwise, your principles are worth nothing. So your principles are really principle, it's not just nominal principles, if you are willing to incur some costs in terms of money or discomfort. And many times you have to incur both. But I think that is the real test. And I think that it would be important for organizations to reveal over time what have they done in difficult cases in order to show that they put their principles where they should be. That's where the real culture is there. Thank you, Jose. No doubt we will come back to this issue. And uh, well, you already alluded to it. Uh, the UK is one of the thought leaders when it comes to thinking about uh, accountability structures. These are probably not the days to talk about democratic accountability, so we better confine ourselves to corporate and individual accountability. Um, but, uh, well, with that, Sam, um, I'd be quite interested to also hear your perspective uh, here. Great. Klaus, uh, thank you very much. And Fernando, happy birthday. Thank you for including me in the panel. And um, Klaus, I should say, I offer my comments today in a spirit of humility for two reasons. The first is that the DMB is genuinely a thought leader in this space and has done some very innovative things. And actually, I had a very enjoyable meeting uh, last year with Frank and his psychologists uh, at the bank. I should clarify, his team of psychologists who work for the DMB, not his own <laughs> psychologists, although it would be interesting to meet them, uh, I, I confess. Uh, and it is, uh, it is interesting what you guys are doing. Um, and actually, I was rather taken with the iceberg. And since that meeting, I've been wondering whether in one of the British banks might like to volunteer to be a guinea pig for the Dutch treatment. So, Jose, perhaps I could leave you uh, with that thought uh, to come back to me in due course. Uh, and my second reason for humility is it did just occur to me that maybe today is not the day for a British panel participant to stand up and tell you how brilliant we are uh, in governments <laughs> in the UK. But with those caveats, um, uh, I will I'll move on. And because I was going last, I've tried to think of three things that other panelists would not raise. And I've succeeded on two, but the third Jose has touched on, so I will um, try not to repeat anything that he said. Um, the first is this, that uh, we in the UK do do fit and proper assessments uh, for people coming into key roles in banks and insurance companies, and uh, many colleagues in other jurisdictions do that as well. And, and my view is that that is a simple, common sense way to try and advance our objective of safety and soundness, because through the process that we put people through, we attempt to identify people who are incompetent, or um, Jose, you mentioned honesty, that's obviously very important, people who are dishonest or lazy or just not right um, for the job. And I, I am a great believer in that, but um, we should acknowledge that there are many jurisdictions where um, that is not done, and it is not done through quite a deliberate choice, and that the view that is taken is that you know, all these processes are imperfect. It's like hiring people for jobs. However scientific you are, some bad apples are going to get through. And when that happens, it's going to be more difficult for you as a regulator to retain your credibility and deal uh, with the problem. So it's quite interesting that even on this quite basic point, in my experience, that is not actually a common view across regulators as which way you, you should go. So I think that's a useful thing for us to consider, maybe with the panel um, to debate. Uh, second point um, is a particular point about the role of non-executive directors in firms. And my, my starting observation would be that compared to the executives in banks and insurance companies, the interests of the non-executives are more often aligned with those of the regulators because we, between us, are more asymmetrically exposed um, to the downside. So I, my experience is that quite often is uh, a useful commonality uh, of interest between the regulator and supervisor and um, uh, non-executives in firms. Uh, but I wanted to ask one question on this, and this is in a way not very politically correct, but I think it's worth exploring. Perhaps I should attempt to provoke Jose here um, on this question. 
which is whether the role that non-executives can play in identifying and mitigating prudential risks relative to what the supervisor can do for themselves is more important at smaller firms. Now, why do I raise that? It's because for a large firm, you know, most of us will have a large dedicated team of supervisors whose only job is to worry about that. At the same time, the larger the firm is, the more difficult I think it is for the non-executives to have a true insight into some of the complexities of what is going on. And if I come over to a small firm, well, it's a practical matter, you know, I might have one-tenth of a supervisor looking at that firm, it would probably be the same for other regulators in the room. But there's still a group of non-executives there who are also overseeing a much simpler firm. So you know, the question is, which flows from that, I think fairly obviously, as a supervisor, do we in effect rely on NEDs more at smaller firms than larger firms? Now, I suspect the answer is no. That's certainly not our approach, but sometimes I wonder if that's a bit of an unsettled question. Uh, and to come to my third and final point, which was the one that Jose touched on, which is this balance between individual and collective accountability. Now, both are important, and, and on the collective side, in particular, we regard the role of the board in institutions as very important in terms of making sure that the firm is properly controlled. But having said that, I have sometimes wondered in the aftermath of the financial crisis whether our expectations of what boards will do collectively, particularly when it comes to you know, very detailed oversight of specific areas, perhaps that's become a little bit unrealistic. And should we put, put a little bit more weight on the accountability of senior individuals, in particular senior executives, to deliver. And that's precisely why we brought in a thing called the senior managers regime in the UK, which applies to the senior executives and a subset uh, of the non-executives um, on the board. And in addition to that, we are now in supervision in the UK, shifting just a bit. We're keeping on both these horses, the collective and the individual, but we are shifting a bit more onto um, and away from the question of the collective board oversight towards you know, which senior executive within the organization and within the senior manager's regime is responsible for delivering this thing that we care about. Um, ex ante, how is their pay reflecting the fact that they're responsible for delivery of that thing? And ex post, particularly if they failed to deliver it, had they been hit uh, in the pocket um, for that failure? And we, while we'll stick with both the individual and the collective approach to this question, are just shifting a little bit more in the individual direction. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Sam. Fortunately, we sort of did touch upon the issue of remuneration, but we didn't exhaust it yet. And so before actually circling this issue back to the panel, I would now like to pose a question to you. So you can again take out your smartphones and, uh, and try to vote. And the question is very simple. Do you think that sort of remuneration requirements can actually be effective in sort of controlling risk taking at a financial institution? So do you think it's very effective, somewhat effective, or not effective at all? We have the voting. It's interesting, by the way, that this is quite a symmetric <laughs> distribution. So uh, the percentage that thinks that it's very effective is actually about as large as the percentage that thinks that it's not effective. Maybe, um, maybe I'll go from right to left this time. Uh, Sam, you start. <clears throat> So maybe I'll just make a single comment on this, which is uh, I was not working as a regulator. I was working at the, the Treasury, the Ministry of Finance in the UK uh, when the financial crisis uh, erupted uh, and was there when we <laughs> pumped £45 billion, as a former panellist mentioned, uh, into RBS and was then very closely involved in dealing with that institution subsequently. And I am absolutely convinced that one of the things that took that institution over the cliff was the ability of people to take out you know, a million pounds, or more, quite a lot more in some cases, in cash at the end of the year for something they'd done during that year, often selling a very long-term contract of some kind which had a P&L um, gain. And I'm absolutely sure that that is a dangerous structure. And I, my personal view is that even quite reasonable people presented with the opportunity to take a million pounds in cash with no questions asked within the scope of what are the rules will do some quite extraordinary things. So I think the right answer to that is deferral and clawback and malice. I don't think that is a perfect solution, but I do think that the old system was a properly dangerous one. Uh, 
I think I think that the views that come from the um, from the audience, I think I think are quite sensible, uh, because I think that remuneration uh, is important, but it's not enough. And 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 I I can relay an anecdote. Um, right after the crisis, in a conversation that, that, that we had at the time with a, uh, the top regulator of one major jurisdiction, he was saying, well, you know, uh, people say they've changed, but the fact of the matter is that when people go to bank, they still tell them, well, you need to make your numbers, and subject to that, be as good as you can, okay? When, when I came to, um, you know, to, to, to the bank in which I, I am today, the, one of the first things I ask is, how are people remunerated? And then I was very pleased to find something which I think has become more and more common practice, which is that people are remunerated first in terms of the how they did their job, in terms of behavior, and only if they go through that gateway, then you start talking about the how well did they do, or what did they do in order to, you know, how, how good they were in performance. So the focus in behavior as a way, gateway to the overall performance in terms of the corporate objectives or the money they made for the bank has basically changed that equation. So you need to be good and beyond that, do the best you can. That's opposite from, from before. So to me, I think this is a big change. And the other one that uh, uh, Sam was saying, the focus of the longer term rather than the short term, compensation or in cash, and then the ability to claw back, to get malus so that the incentives are aligned. But again, the question was in terms of how important are or effective remuneration incentives in controlling a risk taking at financial institutions. Well, remuneration is only part of the answer that many of the things that go into the risk culture of the organization, into the risk governance, which I think are very important as a supplement to remuneration. But if you get the remuneration wrong, then you're going nowhere. Thank you. I have no reason to uh, differ from the previous speakers, um, particularly about what Jose mentioned. But um, I'm a bit skeptical um, when it comes to the uh, top management. Um, I mean, for, for the, uh, uh, the employees or for um, managers up to a certain level, um, certainly um, those remuneration uh, rules and um, um, standards um, uh, might actually have a strong impact. But, um, well, if you go beyond, um, the, the credible threat of your losing um, the job uh, 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 can be much stronger um, in the minds of those people. And um, when we look at those uh, issues uh, of um, um, corporate governance failures, um, it's like typically uh, a very uh, long-standing chairman or uh, uh, very clubby um, closed boards. Um, also, um, I mean, even if you have um, so-called uh, independent uh, directors, I mean, they may not exactly be independent because um, the, the temptation to um, of, of a group think and of this um, comfort of the club is so strong. So, um, well, in a way, this, this the the end result of my thinking is, of course, that um, um, it, it, certainly those. Um, uh, uh, changes made to the remuneration structure and the uh, 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 correcting of the misaligned incentives important, but uh, simply not enough. Uh, I, I, I completely agree with what uh, Sam said at the beginning that clawbacks, uh, deferrals are, are important. Um, I would add that uh, I think remuneration also has to be based on um, multi-year results, which has nothing to do with deferrals, but it's uh, just how you assess the performance of management of a company and uh, how, how do you assess the successful uh, strategy execution that the company has implemented. And this is quite uh, rare to be seen and is frankly also very difficult to set because as I said before, that's not the way we report, that's not the way we're measured ourselves by the external shareholders and investors. Um, I, I do think that uh, uh, the remuneration issue is very important, and so I, I, I understand why supervisors, uh, regulators uh, investigate on that. Um, because yes, I mean, purpose values are important, yes, behaviors are important, yes, the culture is fundamental, 
but the very simple message that you can give to the people in an organization, and if an organization is broad, you need to rely on simple messages is, how do I um, you know, value your performance? And this is eventually how I pay you. And if I tell you that I pay you, if you sell more of a given product, that's a strong message and you, you will get it uh, because you want to be paid and you will comply with it. And vice versa, if I tell you that uh, you, know, you have to deliver customer satisfaction, you understand that and you comply with that and you'll deliver and you care for the customers. So, so the way the remuneration is set in any organization, is, it, it is extremely important. It's soft. Um, I don't think it's easy for uh, supervisors and regulators to judge it. But I think it's important to, to understand uh, what is this organization standing for and what this will organization likely achieve um, um, through their activities in the market. Uh, well, I certainly agree with the audience that it's important, but it's just one factor. And one of the things that I've been thinking about is um, why there is no focus on how directors are remunerated. All the focus is on employees of institutions uh, with the view that directors oversee that and need to pay close attention to it. And the only reason I started thinking about that was because I know that um, practice in North America, for example, would be that you can only align the incentives of board members with shareholders if you require that they hold a lot of shares. So typically it would be three times an annual retainer in, in say, Canada. I checked um, one US GSIB and it was, um, it amounted to a 300,000 US requirement. Now, I actually think that those numbers are probably a drop in the bucket for a lot of the directors, so I'm not sure it aligns incentives, but the curious thing for me was in talking to an Asian director, they said there are no such requirements in Asia. In fact, we would consider requiring directors to hold shares as not aligning incentives because they would be too focused on the short term and, and you know movements in share price in the short term. And I think yeah. it's the same in Europe. There are no such requirements. Um, this, this is, uh, I think, quite a difference of view uh, North America versus other parts of the world. Um, and it was brought up again in the last week, just reading the newspaper, looking at uh, Barclays, and I guess uh, the fourth largest investor uh, wants to get a seat on the board to force a U-turn in the bank's strategy. And other shareholders are saying, you acquired that position with a $1.4 billion loan from Bank of America. So it's a highly leveraged stock position you have and your incentives are not aligned with uh, regular shareholders as a result. Anyway, it's a, it's a, to me, it's um, an interesting and curious area that is definitely uh, tied with remuneration. I actually think that for most directors, um, incentives are probably more related to, uh, well, in the UK, it's probably your process, the senior accountability regime. Um, it's probably got a lot to do with um, the possibility of your fellow directors saying you don't contribute enough, which comes through in uh, board evaluations. It might have something to do with a supervisor asking for a change, that would be embarrassing. Certainly a Royal Commission in Australia, very embarrassing for any directors caught up in that. So perhaps it's personal reputation that at the end of the day is more significant, I don't know, but it's certainly important when, when you're saying that the board is telling you know your management that whatever meet the results in in one year so. okay thank you so we'll um leave the issue of remuneration for a moment we can always come back in the sort of more general part to, toward the end but i'd like to zoom in a little bit more now on sort of what we know about organizational structures and here i'd like to make a little distinction in the panel between uh, the representatives from the official side and the representatives that are actually active within these uh, organizational structures. So first, to uh, the three representatives from, uh, from public institutions, I'd like to ask the question, so what did the crisis teach us about sort of the various organizational structures that are in place, the relationship between the CEO and the chairman of the board, 
having a one-tier board versus having a, a two-tier board, i.e., what, what is the most effective way to organize this challenge to, to sort of the CEO that is necessary to also keep him uh, a little bit aligned? So um, maybe Massa, you start, and then I go to Julie, and then I go to Sam. Thank you very much, John. <clears throat> well, again, this is uh, quite a um, uh, tough question, but uh, on, on, on your specific point about uh, whether a, um, a one-tier structure is uh, superior or two-tier structure is uh, superior, at least um, uh, we at the OECD, we don't make uh, or we cannot make um, any a priori assumption on uh, whichever uh, can be superior. And um, this is because, of course, there are a number of um, um, elements that um, constitute a certain trade-off because, of course, if you have a, a two-tier structure, the tendency will be that uh, uh, the information flows from uh, the people on the ground or the operations uh, will be um, will take more time to reach the, the uh, board level or uh, the the, uh, the, the, the the upper tier, and uh, also um, that um, um, it will be sometimes difficult for uh, those board members to uh, really understand the uh, the business uh, in any depth or in any um, uh, on a real time basis. So. Um, I mean, we have this certain trade-off, but um, what we can say is that, of course, um, uh, whichever structure you adopt, um, we do need a sufficient number of non-executive board members, uh, and of course, with the right people in place. But even more important, uh, possibly, is that uh, they have access to uh, accurate, relevant, and timely information. And we see this um, um, so many times in the, the, the recent scandals because I mean, each, in each incident, I mean, it, it, it's not just really a, a small group of people knowing uh, uh, or doing something wrong. Um, uh, it, it's a much number, a large, larger number of um, people actually having the knowledge, but they somehow don't communicate this to their superiors or to the management, to the board. Uh, or the board does not have uh, real-time access to uh, such information. They don't have a, a, a system of, a, of a checking, um, uh, and uh, um, again, on a timely basis. So somehow we have to ensure that the board has access to that. I mean, whistleblowing is, uh, well, of course, one um, tool that we've been uh, developing. But uh, I mean, this may not even be um, uh, um, uh, applicable in all times, that is, um, um, you, you don't need whistleblowers to, to take the step to, to really go beyond the uh, psychological barrier to, to go to that extent. But uh, if you have good enough information that flows um, to the, the management level and to the board level, then a lot can be prevented, hopefully. Judy. Yeah, well, I think that the CEO runs the company, the chair runs the board, and the CEO is accountable to the board, so that means you should have a separation. But that's a structural characteristic, which doesn't mean you get an effective board at the end of the day. Um, I do know that it's the first announceable when a company gets into trouble that does, has not separated the roles. So Wells Fargo, that was the first thing they announced. We're going to separate the roles of chair and CEO. Tesla is another example, not in the financial sector, but they, they uh, moved to uh, uh, ensure that Elon Musk was only the CEO and not the chair as well. Um, whether that has proved to be effective remains to be seen. Um, I do think that um, the whole question of effectiveness is more related to who's on the board, their competencies, their independence, um, the kind of behaviors they have, their independence of mind, and you have to have a really effective chair who ensures that the debate takes place. Um, as to this two-board structure, which I became familiar with when I was at the ECB, I note Daniel Newey um, has a statement on the website saying, effective corporate governance is possible in any corporate model, regardless of its structure. So that's really saying when the SSM did their corporate governance thematic review, uh, the results are on the website from 2016, um, when they looked at all those institutions, 
uh, what they found as the biggest problem was lack of effective challenge. And they didn't really identify this structural two board thing as a problem. It was more looking at the people on these boards. There is not enough effective challenge. Um, so I think um, in that case, most of those boards did have a separate chair and CEO and still there wasn't effective challenge. So it's just telling you that you need a lot more than a certain structure to get the best result. Yeah. Uh, maybe I can make uh, two points. Uh, first is uh, a few years ago uh, when I joined the Bank of England, I read a book called Lombard Street, which some of you will have read by a man called Walter Badgett, um, and who's thought to be the father of the doctrine of lender of last resort. And anyway, I read it to learn more about a central bank. But interestingly in it, he's got a whole section on his own views on what makes good governance of a bank, a commercial bank rather than a central bank. And basically what he says is that the worst of all governance structures for a commercial bank is the one in which you have a powerful executive uh, overseen by a large number of very well-respected non-bankers. And you know, if you think about what we had before the crash, that's exactly what we had interestingly. And yeah, the reason I think that's the problem is obvious that there's no real challenge given the nature of banking if you don't have any of that expertise in the board. So I take very simple lessons from all that. One is I think a smaller board is generally a bit better. Uh, secondly, I don't think you want the board of a bank to be populated entirely with bankers, but I do think you want a good subset of it to be bankers. And similarly, for an insurance company, you'd want a good subset uh, to be insurers. Just as an aside, on pay of directors, I think that's an interesting point that Julie raises, and I think it's completely unsettled. Uh, the other thing that's unsettled is the level of pay of non-executives was a big gulf across the Atlantic, and I sometimes wonder whether that is actually a problem. It's probably a problem that's politically impossible to solve, but on the EU side. Uh, my second point, much more briefly, is another area where things are unsettled, which is directly on this point, is the role of subsidiary boards. And we've put quite a lot of effort into saying that certain subsidiaries which are particularly important to our objectives <coughs> need to have their own governance. But I don't think there's a commonality of view on how that should work across the regulatory community. Thank you. Um, now I'd like to zoom in on the role that boards of directors play within this organizational structure since we have two uh, members here of, uh, of board of directors. And particularly I'd like to ask you sort of how do you juggle with the various stakeholders that you have? It's often thought that shareholders dominate other stakeholders, but nonetheless other stakeholders also come into the equation. So I'd like to hear a bit more how you do that in practice. And if I may also inject a point here, uh, we just had a, uh, a panel previously about sustainability, maybe not only in the climate uh, dimension, but how do you get sort of also weave uh, this sustainability dimension into it? Maybe this time uh, I'll start with you, uh, Jose. Thank you very much. Uh, first, on the on the role of, of the board of directors, uh, first point is on the separation between the role of the CEO and the and the chairman uh, of the uh, of the bank. And um, there, I think that there are different models which are possible, integration, separation. But I think that the trend is towards separation. And I have run the following experiment uh, sometimes in the boardroom. Uh, I think that most of the time, um, it may be a non-controversial issue that regardless of whether there is separation or not, you would end up in the same place. But there are some important times mm -hmm. where you wonder if the CEO and the chairman, if both of us were the same person, would the outcome of this conversation, the decision we're making, would have been the same or a different one? And in those important opportunities, sometimes it's a different one. So I think that it, it is very important to have a chairman which um, makes the board be truly challenging so that the proposals that come from the executive can be really tested in the boardroom. So for that, you need, of course, to have the right people in the board, uh, people who have sufficient diversity of, uh, in all, you know, in the broader sense, in terms of experiences. As Sam said, you need to have some bankers, but you need to have also people who know about other things. And you have the ability of having a conversation which avoids groupthink. I think it's very important for the chairman to encourage an open and inclusive atmosphere so that there are no dumb questions and that people feel that they are there to challenge, not just to assent and agree, but to challenge and to do so in a constructive way and then call to attention those you know, directors which are not doing their job 
in terms of not being uh, sufficient, sufficient, sufficiently challenging when you think that they should have been uh, uh, so. Very important also the issue of independence. Massa mentioned this. You do not only need nominal independence, but also real independence. And this may be a bit uncomfortable sometimes for this group CEO or for a chairman who's also an executive chairman, but I think that this is very important. People who really are, are really independent and, and, and with the ability and the willingness to be, uh, uh, to be challenging. And I think that given the requirements that boards have now, I think you need to uh, bring in people who are committed to put as much time as needed. And this is something which sometimes uh, can, be, can be a lot. And the issue of the quality of management information. A board at the end is only willing to discuss the things which are presented by, to them by management. So I think it's very important for the role of the chairman to make sure that the quality of management information is right in terms of quantity and also in terms of, of content. Second issue in terms of uh, other stakeholders beyond shareholders. And this goes back to the issue of the purpose of the organization. And if you have a purpose, that, that normally goes beyond uh, your shareholders because you are in the world to do something which is, which is good. Otherwise, you don't have really the right to exist. And from that point of view, uh, you know, even the UK uh, uh, corporate code, which now has been uh, revisited, uh, makes it very clear that you have to have sufficient regard for the interests of other stakeholders. And that is something that needs to be part of the conversation. Finally, on the issue of sustainability that you mentioned, uh, this is something which is important for any organization in the long term, certainly for a bank. And this needs to be seen not only in terms of the aspects of stability that we were talking about before in terms of climate change, but also in terms of uh, an opportunity, something that can be a differentiator, competitive differentiator, and something that would be uh, you know, aligned to the things that make you different and therefore uh, successful over the long term. Thank you. From the chairman to the CEO, Mario, your perspective, please. Um, so, so the relationship between chairman and CEO is probably the most important one uh, for any organization. The chairman has to be uh, the challenger, has to be the controller, and has to be the supporter of the CEO um, every day. Otherwise, uh, there is an immense risk of uh, creating an unsustainable management environment uh, if the CEO is, uh, is let go uh, without, uh, without what I said from the chairman. That calls for, um, for special characteristics of the chairman. The chairman has to, um, to have competence and understand what uh, the CEO is supposed to do, has to have experience for that, has to have leadership, but at the same time as to respect uh, the respective roles and not trying to become CEO himself because that would, would just confuse everyone in the organization. So it's a, it's a careful balance um, and uh, um, it's not always perfect, but uh, it's probably the most important thing that has to happen um, in an organization. Um, on the board composition, um, I, I think it's very important that I'm speaking for my, for my role as a CEO of an organization, it's very important to have competences there. Not necessarily um, the competences that I have and the management has for running the business, but competences that will help us running the business in a better way. Um, so on our board, we've been searching for uh, digital knowledge or we've been searching for uh, distribution knowledge that uh, we might not even have ourselves. And so we highly appreciate the contribution by board members uh, who bring us these competences. And we have um, insurance people. Um, the chairman himself at our company is a former insurance manager and super competent and super knowledgeable about insurance. And we all appreciate the fact that whenever we bring things to the board or whenever they ask things, um, they uh, immediately understand uh, what kind of answer we're giving and they can judge that. That is reassuring for management. It is uh, healthy for the organization. Um, on sustainability, um, I, I mean, we, f f for us, uh, this is a very important topic, as I think I said before. The board um, at Zurich Insurance has the responsibility to drive strategy and to drive sustainability, and they exercise that. 
um, and they give me targets on sustainability. And, uh, and one reason to give me targets is also because they want me to pass these targets down and they want the organization to be aware of the duties we have um, for sustainability. We interpret sustainability in different aspects. Um, one aspect which is very important for us is uh, um, a workforce in transition and labor. Um, financial services, insurance for sure, and presumably also banking, of which I'm not competent, but I presume is similar, um, will have lots of changes in labor. Um, we are experimenting robots on claims. So we're experimenting robots in capturing uh, data from uh, policies and uh, reporting this data in our uh, databases, administrative databases. This is, is going <coughs> to, excuse me, this will change um, in a, a thorough way um, the labor composition over the next years. Uh, we took it as, as an obligation uh, to the board and to the society to retrain the people and minimize the impact of that on society. But I have to say that the board has been, has been raising this up and is controlling, is monitoring, is pushing, and is uh, rewarding uh, that we care for this, which, which I take it as, uh, as a great responsibility for the board and the very right one. Um, of course, we care for climate change. I mean, we're an insurance company. We're exposed to catastrophes of every kind. Uh, one that uh, we don't often talk about uh, is also the uh, risks uh, that uh, we are growing in terms of diseases because of deforesting a big part of the world and we are moving germs and bacteria and viruses uh, towards uh, a city and, uh, and populations. Um, and we're very aware of all these things uh, because this is our job to ensure the life of the people and the properties of the people. Um, so I think, I, I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a thin balance, the one the board has to do between providing responses to sustainability, which means society, providing um, you know, responses to shareholders, which eventually will make uh, the company thriving over time, and then uh, you know, managing well the relationship with the employees of the organization and the customers, which is about the remuneration and the choice they make on the people that they appoint in the position. I don't think there is, uh, um, there, is, there is a standard framework for that. This is why boards are so important, and this is why um, the chemistry in the board is so, is so relevant. Thank you. There is one last uh, dimension that I'd like to now uh, inject to the discussion. Uh, usually when we talk about boards and directors, etc., we think in terms of he and him, uh, as there's this common practice, I think, everywhere still in our part of the world, uh, and much less so in terms of she and her. Now, we all know uh, the famous comment by Christine Lagarde that had Lehman Brothers been Lehman Sisters, that it <laughs> might not have ended up belly up. Uh, now, in the meantime, there is actually some scientific research which sort of questions whether there are systemic di systematic differences in risk tolerance. However, what I think is undisputed is that diversity in the broader sense of the word leads to a much richer sort of discussion and a much richer sort of incorporation of the different perspectives uh, that one can take on an issue that is put on the, on the board table. So before going into this discussion, again, the floor is yours on the questions, what is actually your view on the pace of progress with respect to promoting gender diversity? I think diversity is broader than gender, but here we have to focus it a little bit. So here we focus on gender diversity. So if I may have your votes, Okay, so again, limited progress. Well, a, sig a significant amount of people think that we've made significant progress, and of course, there's also a significant amount that says, what progress? <laughs> <laughs> well, that I think is uh, already gives some diversity in views, which I think are welcome, and I hope that the panel is as diverse as the audience. So maybe, Sam, if I start from you this time. Great, maybe to make uh, uh, two points. So the first is in terms of the uh, diversity in its various forms uh, at the top of the institutions that we oversee. Um, you know, we, we do hold that diversity of thought is a helpful thing from a safety and soundness perspective, and sometimes the diversity of thought will flow from a diversity of attributes. Um, but I think there are some limits to how far you can push that thought 
as the regulator is my, my personal view, we've done some things. Uh, what I observe happening, but Jose will be better able than me um, to speak to this probably, is uh, quite considerable progress uh, amongst non-executives and rather less progress amongst executives. Um, the second point is just in relation to ourselves as an institution. Of course, we also have an agenda um, in this regard. And we have done rather better on uh, gender than on ethnic diversity amongst our senior ranks. And the one thing that we've changed recently to try and help on all of that, and which I think actually is going to make quite a big difference, is at our, I suppose it's our senior manager level. So these are people in the kind of middle of their careers. We've stopped allowing those appointments to be made individually. Uh, and those appointments now have to be made in groups. And it has to be approved by the very top of the, the institution. And although this has caused some irritation and it slows down the processes a bit, I actually think that that single change is still going to allow us to appoint the best people for the jobs, but to consider, purely for the reasons of appointing a group rather than one person at a time, the collective impact as well. Well, gender diversity, I think, is key at all levels of the organization, in terms of the board, in terms of the senior positions, and in terms of all the other, uh, the, all the other layers. And I think that this is something which is uh, in the self-interest of organizations, of banks in particular, given that it's not only a question of fairness, but also something, as you were saying, there is some uh, you know, uh, empirical evidence that suggests that organizations which have more gender diversity tend to be more stable. Uh, and also, it's an issue of productivity. You need the best ideas uh, around the table, and having a diverse group of people assures you that you have a better chance of having the, the best ideas around. Now, have we made enough progress? Well, let's think of the following um, statistic. Only 2% of uh, bank CEOs are women, and only and less than 20% of board members in banks are women. So yeah, we may have made some progress, but you can see that there is still uh, much, much more to go. Um, now, things which may be uh, helpful here in order to correct this market failure to have enough uh, gender diversity in organizations. I think it's very important, and we have found that in, inside the bank, to have a diversity and inclusion council, which is really owned by the uh, top of the organization and supported by the top of the organization. And that can make sure that everyone in the, uh, uh, in the institution really is uh, pushing in the same direction. Uh, and initiatives coming out of there in terms of fighting unconscious bias, something which is very important in, in, in real, uh, the, you know, in everyday life. The issue of scorecards, including diversity and inclusion metrics as part of the scorecards, which are going to determine people's and group performance and which then have an impact on remuneration. And then putting in place policies to make life easier for, uh, you know, uh, to, to enhance gender diversity. For example, you know, the right maternity and paternity leave policies, flexible time, working from home, and then sort of mentoring uh, for, you know, women who want to come back to the workforce after having uh, had uh, children. So all of these flexible employee policies are also very important. But I think that this is an issue where we still, you know, very far, far away in the financial services industry and in banking in particular, of where we should be. And it is in our interest to move forward. Thank you. Um, a lot of room to improve. And of course, um, I, since I come from Japan, we know that um, we have um, a relatively uh, bad score in terms of gender diversity in boards and also in among parliamentarians and in government uh, all around. But um, um, since I'm working in an international organization, um, I uh, also uh, want to uh, uh, um, stress um, the importance of geographical diversity as well. And so it's not just about gender, but it's also um, um, more diversity in several um, dimensions. And um, the only last um, um, uh, point that I want to make really is that, um, again, um, I hope this uh, will not create another box to tick because, of course, um, it is all important to have the, 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 the person who can really do the job uh, knowing or um, making every effort on a daily basis to understand the business and then um, challenge the uh, decisions. 
Now, um, this is uh, easier said than done. Um, I mean, involving deep-seated uh, cultural issues. Um, and I must say that uh, in all honesty, um, in, in Japan, for example, a long-standing uh, um, uh, male CEO is not used to being challenged by a, a junior female employee. It's just, just a simple fact, and we have to uh, somehow change the culture. Uh, but, um, well, um, so there's a lot to be done, but um, well, at least we are, I think we are moving in the right direction. But it seems to me that also in Japan, junior becomes senior and then can be yes. appointed, right? I mean, uh, Mario. <laughs> you know, it, is, it is extremely important. Uh, there are many different uh, meanings of uh, uh, diversity. Uh, the easiest one to address is the one of uh, men versus female, or at least for us, it has been the easiest. Um, I think we made um, at our company some progress on that. Uh, more than 40% of board members are female. Uh, more than 40% of the executive committee of the organization are female. Um, we actually have more than 60% of our PNL run by, by women, uh, by men. Uh, having said that, I, I, I think there is a lot more that we can do on gender because we're fundamentally run by Western educated people. Uh, board and management. So there is a strong homogeneity of culture background um, through the organization. Um, the other thing which I um, struggle to, um, to improve is the age issue. Um, there will be lots of benefits in having uh, young people contributing and leading and, and bringing their different views. But the organization are highly hierarchical and before the young people get up, I mean, they're not young anymore. Um, and that's, that's an issue I'm trying to sort out by creating council, by creating parallel organizations. Uh, but there is a lot of resistance in organization, even if you do that. Um, and that is probably uh, one of the declination of diversity that uh, uh, is becoming more and more important. Uh, the culture that I have is not the culture of millennials, and millennials are soon to become uh, themselves quite old uh, because there is a new generation coming on board, and they see very differently the society, the needs, the future, and it's interesting to, uh, to have the views uh, reported up in your organization, but it's not easy to, to, to find uh, um, good and sustainable solution inside the organization. It was not a coincidence that I started on this end, uh, Julie. The last <laughs> word is on you. <laughs> well, because I'm a member of this panel, I knew about the question in advance, and I thought, I don't know the answer. I knew there was progress, but was it limited or significant? So I tried to get the answer, and um, I looked at a couple of things. One, the, I looked at the top 12 GSIBs in the top three buckets. The very top is empty, of course. And uh, in terms of boards of directors, most were around 30% uh, in terms of gender diversity. The largest, though, was only at 2%, which I found quite shocking. Um, and, and then there are a few around 40, and I think a lot are actually aiming for higher. Um, but then last week I saw, you may be familiar with this close, Equileap, it's called. It's a nonprofit based in Amsterdam and it tracks corporate gender equality and identifies the top 200 firms globally and how they do on this measure. And they actually, um, they don't, don't just look at um, male versus female, they look at um, policies like paid leave for maternity uh, leave for primary child caregivers, publication of gender segregated pay, policy on anti-sexual harassment, and they look at um, gender diversity across all levels, so board, executive, senior management, and workforce. And the good news for the financial sector is that we are in the top three. So communications, utilities, and financial sector are in the top three. I think financial sector was second, looking at all those factors. And I did note that 12 of um, the 29 GSIBs are on the top 200 firms globally. So kudos to them. Would you like the names? All right. The names are, uh, it, and JP Morgan made that list, even though the, at the board of directors it's woefully low. JP Morgan, Citi, Bank of America, Barclays, BNP, Paribas, BNY Mellon, ING Bank, 
Royal Bank of Canada, Societe Generale, Standard Charter, and State Street and UBS. And UBS, of course, had the rather unfortunate experience yesterday of the article in the newspaper about uh, how uh, uh, new mothers are treated when they come back. But it is on the top 200 list uh, globally, so I think, you know, I've, I've not known a lot about Equilib, but it seems to be one of the few that's doing research in this area. Thank you so much. Well, we call upon your overtime, so thank you very much uh, for having borne with us. And I think uh, a round of applause for the panelists and that. <laughs>